There is a place where crafts are forged and forgotten, hidden deep within the drawers of memory, where secret techniques are revealed to those who love fall. Hello, happy fall, and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be showing you how I made the old mill from over the garden wall. What you'll need for this build is some foam board, some popsicle sticks, some coffee stir sticks, some twine, some craft foam, and a few other things that we'll get into later. Let's get into it. So I started by sketching the whole thing out on some one inch graph paper. I wanted this to be 28 millimeter scale so it can be thrown into a Dungeons and Dragons game. I started with my one inch by one and a half inch door and then I used that as reference to plan out the rest of the building. Once I got the shape mostly right, I cut the pieces out of foam board. I highly recommend using a sharper knife than I did. I ended up having to trim a couple millimeters off the front and back to account for the bulk of the foam board when the sides were attached. Once I had all my pieces cut out, I beveled the front and back so I could glue the roof into place at an angle. Again, my dull knife made this very messy, but it's all going to be covered up later so it doesn't really matter. Once I had all the foam board pieces cut out, I put them together with some hot glue. And then I realized that I put the window in the wrong place, so I fixed that. <laughs> Again, this is all going to be covered by the siding so I wasn't worried about how clean it was. Up next, I made the roof windows or dormer windows using the same technique, foam board for the sides, and then some placeholder cardboard on the top. I ended up replacing this with balsa wood later, but you could keep it as cardboard if that's all you had on hand. Next, using some plastic packaging, I made some glass for the windows. I cut these out bigger than they needed to be because I knew I was going to be covering that with some wood later on. Then using some more foam board, I cut out a chimney shape. In the show, the chimney is very narrow. If I was going for a more realistic look, I would have glued a few pieces of foam board together, but for this project, one was enough. And then I spent hours and hours cutting bricks out of craft foam. There are much better ways of making bricks for tabletop gaming, but craft foam is what I had on hand and I wanted to get rid of it. Once I started gluing, I realized all the bricks were too big, so I had to individually recut every brick. I think the final result ends up looking really good, but it took a very long time. Luckily, my time is worthless. Off camera, I made a teeny tiny window using some more recycled plastic and some tiny coffee stir sticks cut in half and placed very carefully. So when gluing the bricks into place, I used hot glue on the corners so that they could wrap around and quickly adhere, and then I used tacky glue for the rest so I could play with it a little bit more. Since this is an old, worn down cottage, I wanted the bricks to have slightly different shapes to make it look a bit more organic. And then it was time for the water wheel. I needed something circle shaped, so I went into the kitchen and found this rice cooker lid. I then traced that circle shape onto some foam board and cut it out. Then I measured a few centimeters around the outside, all the way around until I had another circle, and then I cut that out until I had a ring. And then I used the same method and made another one. Then it came time to build the turning mechanism for the water wheel. For this I used the fan from an old bubble toy and a broken mechanical pencil. I attached the smallest tube to the fan with the help of some wire, and then I slid that tube into the bigger tube, and then bam, you got something that spins. Then I cut off the blades of the fan to give me the front center circle of my water wheel. Then to create the back circle, I used an old base from a Warhammer Mini, slid that into place, and glued it about an inch apart from the front. Then it was time to put it all together. To put the water wheel together, I used the rings we made earlier, some more foam board cut to be the spokes of the water wheel. They should be about one inch by the radius of your water wheel. Some more foam board pieces cut one inch by a couple centimeters. These will be the continuation of the spokes and they'll go around the outside of the water wheel. And then some cardboard strips cut to the width of your water wheel. I started by gluing cardboard strips into the inside edge of one of the rings, doing my best not to leave any gaps. Then I fit the other ring onto the cardboard and put some tacky glue all along the other edge. Using tacky glue allowed me more time to get this into the right position. Then using hot glue I glued the rest of the cardboard strips around the outside edge with the logo facing down so no one knows where your cardboard came from. I then glued the smaller strips of foam board around the outside one inch apart. I chose one inch so that minis could fit nicely in between those pegs, cause you know they're gonna fight on that water wheel. Gluing the spokes in was a lot harder than I expected. It took me a few tries, and I had to cut some as I went. I found gluing the spokes from opposite ends one at a time was the best way of going about it. With some effort, I ended up with a beautiful, though slightly wobbly, water wheel. <laughs> Next, I went back to the barn to do the siding and the roof. For the siding, I used coffee stir sticks set at different heights so it would look a bit more organic. 
Then for the roof, I cut popsicle sticks slightly wider than the coffee stir sticks because I'm crazy and I thought it would look better. I do think it looks good though. Off camera, I made this adorable little door using a piece of cardboard and some more coffee stir sticks. The knocker is a little sliver of the tube from the mechanical pencil from earlier. To give the bricks a better texture, I used some modeling paste. Now not everyone has modeling paste at home, but as you can see, I've had this jar for a long time. A jar this size costs about $16 and I've had it for over five years, so I recommend picking some up because it's useful for a lot of projects. To get started on the modeling paste, just slap it on, use a lot, and then dab away with a paper towel to get the desired texture and take away those brush strokes. This step is great because it helps fill in any gaps or cover any mistakes. So now that the buildings are looking good, we need to make them look bad. I took an X-Acto knife and a wire brush and I added some wood texture and some weathering to both buildings. And then I thought, if this is going to be used for D&D, I'm going to need some minis. That's what I'm talking about. I made these adorable little friends using an armature wire skeleton and building up their bodies with green stuff, adding details as I went. This process was hard to film because I started over so many times. These were the first minis I made completely from scratch, but I'm super happy with how they came out. Finally, it's time to start putting it all together. I made the base of this using more foam board, building up the layers to create hills and the iconic path shape. There are better ways to build texture, but again, foam board is what I had on hand. Next, I made the big boulder, that boulder, the same way using even more foam board. I glued a bunch of pieces together to create the desired thickness, and then I should have waited for it to dry, but I was too impatient, and I just started carving to create that organic shape that I wanted. And then finally, once it was dry, I added a sloppy layer of modeling paste around the whole thing. I know XPS foam would have been better to build this boulder, but I couldn't get access to any at the time. Also, I want to show that you can make great terrain with what you have around you. Then it was time to put all that together. To finish the landscape, I used even more modeling paste, some cat litter as smaller rocks, and some rocks from outside that I boiled for safety. I did a big sloppy coat of modeling paste, being mindful of the brush strokes for the path. I then sprinkled on the cat litter directly onto the modeling paste, carefully placed my stones, and finally my boulder. In the end, it looked like this. Wow. Finally, it was time to prime. I primed all the minis in black. Normally I wouldn't do this if I was going to paint light skin tones, but it ended up having a really neat effect. The black showed through everywhere that I couldn't get paint into, and it acted almost as line work, which fit in this cartoon style. I then did a layer of black Mod Podge for the mill and the roof of the cottage. I chose to use white Mod Podge for the rest because I wanted the grout to be a lighter color in the end. Lastly, I primed the base in the same matte black as the minis. I started with the minis because I was the most excited about them. Now I'm not a great painter. Okay, painting is my trade, though I find most of the skills don't really transfer when it comes to miniature painting. I started with the skin tones and then moved on to other big shapes. I don't have a lot of advice when it comes to painting. I usually just paint and then mess up and fix it and paint and mess up and fix it until I'm happy with it. I chose to use a round felt tipped pen for the pupils of the eyes. I could have painted these easily because they were so cartoonishly big, but I chose to use this because I like the shape that it makes. And I chose not to use any washes because I wanted to keep that matte, flat, cartoony look to them. Then to create the water effect, I started by painting the river with a mix of black and bluish grays. Then once it dried, I covered the whole thing in hot glue and using a heat gun, I smoothed out all the ugly bits. Now later you'll notice there's a stone missing. That is because this was not my final river attempt. When I tested this technique, it worked perfectly, but when I went to do the final thing, it dried very opaque and I wasn't sure what I was doing wrong. But if you look at a glue stick in its natural state, it is opaque. So to do this technique, you need to use a very thin layer of hot glue so that it dries transparent. There are better materials for making realistic water effects, but this is a great one to use if you're on a budget. I painted the boulder a nice puke brown, and then I went back to the cottage and I painted the grout a mix of tan and threw in a couple variations of green and gray that don't show up later on. 
Next, I dry brush the mill and the water wheel with a bluish greenish gray. This is the first step to getting that old weathered wood look. While that dried, I went back to the cottage and painted the bricks individually different shades of blues, greens, browns, and tans. This gets significantly dulled down later, but it gives the piece a lot more variation and it makes the rocks look like they were found. Then I painted the roofs a slightly greener gray. This whole scene is very desaturated, so I added as much variation as I could while keeping the whole piece, well, gray. Next thing I did was dry brush with a slightly lighter gray, and then you see all of my hard work fade away as I dry brush the gray onto the stones. And then to finish off the weathered wood look, I gave the whole thing a white dry brush. I did the same thing on the roof, this helps unify the two tones. And then I covered the base with a beautiful variation of gorgeous brown tones that will later be completely covered by flock. But you and I know it's there, so that's what matters. I let those gorgeous browns rest and then covered them all with Mod Podge and began flocking. To make the flocking, I used twine in a method that I learned from Bard's Craft. Check out their video to see how I made mine. Flocking is amazing. If you haven't tried it before, I highly recommend it. It is super easy and it makes your building look so much better. Now, the water effect was pretty good on its own, but I wanted to give it a bit more movement. So using some modeling paste, I painted along the river edge to give it some white caps, and then using the variation in the glue texture as a guide, painted some more white caps throughout the river as well. And then it came time for the washes. Now as an oil painter by trade, I have an abundance of oil paint, but this is only my second time trying to use them as washes. I started by mixing a blackish green for the buildings and an ochre for the path and some of the rocks. The river looked very blue in direct sunlight, so I did a few passes of black wash over it. This ended up giving it a matte finish, which I think for this project worked well, but I wouldn't recommend it for other projects. A lot of the white caps were too thin and ended up drying transparent, so I added some bolder white caps using the same technique later on. I then dry brushed the rocks and both buildings again with white to bring back those highlights and edge details. Then using a little more Mod Podge and flocking, I added some moss details onto the boulder and the buildings. This helped unify the piece and helped fill in any unsightly gaps. Now there isn't actually any moss on the buildings in the show, but I'd rather be extra than accurate. And how would the adventurers find their way without a... Candy trail, candy trail, candy trail. So I added a little more litter along the path and painted it some bright candy colors. And as one final detail, I added some autumn colors onto the flocking to look like fallen autumn leaves. And with that, it's time for the glamour shots. How the gentle wind beckons through the leaves as autumn colors fall, dancing in a swirl of golden memories, the loveliest lies of.
And so, the video is complete. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you'd like me to make in my next video. And subscribe so I have an excuse to keep making them. And don't forget to eat your dirt. <laughs>